in like 89, like 90, late 80s, early 90s, the scene was pretty much heavy metal. Like the big band at the time was Saigon Kick, who nobody probably remembers. Anyways, that was like, I mean, Jane's Addiction just broke. And then you have like Alice in Chains. You know, Motley Crue was kind of like the end of their thing. But everybody was kind of emulating that sort of a thing. And then like you, then Nine Inch Nails, so you had industrial music, stuff like that. So either you had bands that were trying to be like Nine Inch Nails or like metal, like the Saigon Kick type of thing. And then, uh, and then Manson like started his thing, so he had like the heavy Nine Inch Nails influence and, and that. And then he was friends with that band Saigon Kick. So that's kind of like how he got started like with the idea of doing a band. And, and that was that. I used to see Manson out at clubs like a lot and uh, we'd always look at each other like the girls at the prom like ooh, what's she in that dress she, you know catty glances that sort of thing and then uh, I was at a Love and Rocket show and I got dragged out of there by the cops like in uh, Hogtide and he saw that and so then there was another incident with it again that band Saigon Kick played and uh, I like spit in the guy's face it was a big scene broke out and so he saw he saw me like at clubs all the time like getting into trouble and doing all this and that with like crazy hair and makeup and nutty clothes and so I guess that like attracted him and then I met him at some club in Miami I think it was the kitchen club and he came up to me and he says oh hey I got this band you know I might need a bass player would you be into it and I said no I'm I'm a guitar player I'm, I'm playing hardcore I don't think I don't think you can handle it. You know, he's like, no, nah, just, just come and check it out. So he gave me a tape and it was brilliant. It was like so lo-fi and arty, very creative. I never heard anything like it. And I was like, wow, this is, this is boss. So I went to see them play and he came up to me again and said, look, we don't like this bass player. Come on, play for us. And I, I said, I, I don't know, I'll check it out. So they got like the Nine Inch Nails gig where they opened up for him and they, they wanted me to play that show. So. I'm like, that sounds cool, you know, I'll try it. So I, uh, the Scott would come over to my house and uh, show me some bass lines and this and that, showed me like three or four songs that they had. And then we wrote some more songs together, then we played the Nine Inch Nails gig, and that was like my first gig in the band, like in front of like thousands of people. I was like, ah, oh, this is cool, you know? So that's why I did that. Well, the music was great. I mean, if if their image matched the music, you know, it would have, it would have been great. But their image was kind of like, like industrial club, like Nine Inch Nails, not very much style. You know, it was just like, I mean, Manson had no tattoos. I think he still had like brown hair at that time. He looked kind of like a, a gothic version of like Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So, I mean, they had like, they had like something going on, but they had no image really. And I think it's what I brought to the band. You know, I had like, I already had my image from years from listening to like the New York Dolls and the Sex Pistols and Motley Crue and all that. So I was like a dirty, you know, gutter glam kid. So I brought that element to the band and then the lunch boxes and, you know, all that, all that stuff. When I saw them play, like their, I guess it was their second gig, like right before I joined the band, they had like a girl in a cage and it wasn't very original. So they, they had some kind of theatrics, you know, but it wasn't, it, you know, I joined the band and it just was a progression of things. You know, we just bounced ideas off of each other and it's just, we just wanted to have fun. We didn't want to like, we wanted to have a band that would be like a band we would want to go see. You know, that's pretty much why we did it. We weren't trying to be shocking or scary. We just wanted to be entertaining. You know, because I'd go to concerts and I'd see some of my favorite bands and after three, three songs, I'd just be bored. I'm like, there's got to be something more to this. It's like, why can't it be like theater? Why can't we bring back like the Alice Cooper, the Bowie, the Kiss sort of things, you know? And so that we just like emulated our influences and it was like... It wasn't so much that we were like stealing or ripping off, it was more of like an homage to what we were into. 
Well, as far as the names, like Manson came up with his stage name, Marilyn Manson, before the band, before he even picked up a microphone. He was writing for a magazine and wanted to have a pseudonym. So he came up with that. And I guess the reason was <clears throat> he'd be watching the talk shows and like one day they'd have on Charles Manson. <clears throat> the next day it would be like old movie stars and stuff. So he figured like society as a whole is like light and dark and is some kind of statement based on that. And so we all had the names, came up with the names for the band. And then uh, I joined the band and we, we decided to like, you know, I need the name. So I came up with, uh, I came up with the Gein part first because I was always influenced by Ed Gein. You know, he was the guy in the 50s that Psycho and Silence of the Lambs, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was based on. And also my stepdad grew up in that town where that happened in Wisconsin. He used to always tell me stories about it. And I was like, man, this, this guy's crazy. You know, and he was like digging up graves, peeling off their skin, wearing their skin as clothes. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of like a borderline transvestite and I'm into like horror movies. And like Ed Gein's perfect for me. And then Gidget just was like a cute name, you know, to put the two together. It means nothing. It's like I didn't was into the Gidget movies or anything. So as far as any sort of philosophical meaning to to my name, you know, there really was none. As far as Manson's concerned, I guess he had some kind of like deep meaning, but really it was just like a juxtaposition of like names and kind of like a statement on society, if you want to get as deep as that. All right, when, when Steve uh, Pogo joined the band, otherwise known as M Wayne Gacy, Marilyn, uh, Madonna Wayne Gacy, he, uh, they had a sampler, keyboard player in the band before that, but it was like typical samples, what other people were doing, you know, again, like the Nine Inch Nails, Nitzareb, that sort of thing. But uh, Pogo came into the band and He's kind of like an evil genius. He's like one of the smartest guys I know, but also like the stupidest, you know. But he brought this like mad scientist element to the band where he like knew all this sampler trickery and stuff. So, and we would sample, you know, we'd give him ideas of what to sample. And it was like stuff from movies like John Waters films and all that. But he would take it and twist it and make it like unrecognizable. And it was like very, it was almost like a... Uh, kind of like some kind of like crazy like Dada art put into the into the music that he brought to the band. The way we wrote music as far as when I got into the band is the music would always come first you know and it would be just a riff you know whether it was Scott coming up with a, uh, a guitar line I mean sometimes he'd come up with like a whole song but then I would like if Scott would write the song first, I would like add the bass line and I would never try to copy the guitar because I just thought it was boring. So like it was always a collaborative effort. Everybody wrote their own parts. And a lot of times I would come up with a bass line and then write the song and then give it to Scott and then he would do the music. And then uh, then Manson would write the lyrics. Manson like had some little Casio keyboard and I think he wrote like Dope Hat on that. Maybe some other songs he came up with the, the riff and the hook. But it was a collaborative effort. It was pretty much equal, the amount of uh, input. And then uh, Pogo, he like wrote a couple lines too, but mostly he was just doing samples and stuff like that. Well, one of the things I liked about Manson was he was influenced by like propaganda, which is something I've always been into. And I would see stickers and flyers for, for Manson before they even had a band. They were promoting like, he kind of came up with Marilyn Manson as like a make-believe band. It wasn't even like something he was going to do, I think, you know, until he met Scott and then they decided to start a band. But that was like the main thing, you know, promoting, 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 making flyers, making posters, T-shirts, anything to like get the name out. And the philosophy, you know, we had is if you have your name everywhere, people are going to think you're famous because they see everywhere. Even if they don't like see it, they're going to see it, you know. And then when you tell them, oh, yeah, I'm in Marilyn Manson, they're like, oh, I heard of you guys. You guys are great, you know. So it's like it's it's propaganda and publicity. And that's like... 
what's lacking in a lot of bands today and art in general it's there's no like publicity and it's like you can have so much talent but if you're not promoting yourself and getting your name out you're you're dead you know so that that's that's like the first thing i liked about manson was i would see see the name everywhere it's like it's brilliant you know it's like you... well as far as the stage shows goes we probably spent just as much time on that that we did as the, as the music maybe, maybe even more because you know, we wanted to have a stage show and we wanted to be a band that we would want to go see. You know, so we were just always kind of trying to think stuff up, you know, because we had short attention spans. Maybe it's because we were TV babies, you know, and fed, you know, cereal our whole lives and the sugar just made us go crazy. But that's, you know, so we just did whatever we could think of, man, like artistically, you know, like one, one time we had a show, Halloween show. And we thought, well, let's get a pinata. You know, that'd be cool. You know, the pinata where you hit with the stick and the candy. I'm like, well, I mean, why don't we fill it with meat? You know, so we went to the store and we got a bunch of raw meat and then dog food for like filler and blood and just packed the pinata full of meat and had it on the stage um, above us and had it there the whole time. And at the end of the show, like the last song, we're like, okay, here's the stick, you know. And some big skinhead grabbed the stick and hit the pinata. And uh, the meat and everything just flew all over the dance floor. And so there's skinheads, punk rockers, like slam dance and slipping all in blood and, and guts. So that, that was kind of like uh, how our lives were, you know, just trying to have fun and slipping and sliding in blood and guts. Our image was kind of like we were seen as like satanic bisexual junkies. So we just exploited that, you know, so people thought we were satanic, so we gave them Satan, you know. Uh, I think Manson was influenced by Anton LaVey and the Satanic Bible. I, I don't really know at that period. I know later on he got into that, but we just like, it, it was kind of like a horror movie, you know. It wasn't meant to be like, look, look at us, we're going to kill you. It was kind of like, you know, we're heavily influenced by horror movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, Night of the Living Dead and all that. So just like we emulated our, our rock idols, we emulated movies as well or TV. You know, it was like whatever we were into, we, you know, kind of like wanted to, in a way, turn people onto it, you know, so we would like take our influences and put it in the show or in the music or whatever, whether it was like a John Waters movie where we'd have like a big fat girl in, in a uh, in a crib, you know, eating eggs, or it was like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre with like you know blood and chickens on stage, you know that sort of thing, you know, and and then so people thought we were like drug addicts, and at that time we weren't really doing much drugs, you know, just kind of dabbling. But people thought we were junkies, so then we exploited that. We would have, you know, hypodermics, you know, syringes and do all that. And then people thought we were gay, so we'd have, like, kind of gay sex on stage or whatever, you know, just exploiting the whole. What people want, we gave them and more. We crammed it down their throats. Yeah, it was like the antithesis of uh, pop culture, you know, like uh, a lot of stuff that wasn't popular it was popular, people knew it, but it wasn't popular to like it. So, But that's what we were into. We were into, you know, subversion and kitsch and, you know, trash. You know, whether, again, it was like, you know, John Waters or, you know, what, whatever. You know, it's just that's what we were into. We weren't into, like, well, you know, actually we were into everything, whether it was Madonna, New Kids on the Block, you know, or snuff films you know we, we liked it all it was just uh we we're kind of re of a reflection of what society was into it was kind of like i don't know looking at the back of a mirror sort of thing well when when we when the band started like grunge was popular, whether it was uh, Nirvana, Alice in Chains, um, Grunt Truck, you know, all those Seattle bands. And we loved all that stuff. We were really into that. 
if if we didn't have makeup and and keyboards, we would have been a grunge band. You know, pretty much those songs are are grunge songs stripped down. So that there's that influence, and then two other bands that were like popular at that time were Jane's Addiction and White Zombie, and that was like those were my two biggest influences at that time, and also Manson was into that. So I mean, if you look at us back then. I mean, you can obviously see Jane's Addiction and, and White Zombie. You know, it's like, if you put those two bands together, that's what we would have been, you know. So, you, there was, we had that influence and, you know, the grunge, and then, like, everybody else had their own influence. You know, I was into, like, New York Dolls and the Dead Boys and punk rock. And then uh, Steve uh, Pogo was into, like, old... Uh, old punk like a uh, gang of four and then like big black and all that but then manson was all into the nine inch nails and all that industrial stuff and then uh daisy the guitar player he he liked so much like pretentious like art rock whether it was like the cocktoo twins or this and that and the the bands he was into were cool but he always would make a point of showing like how sophisticated he was because of the what he was into I used to always tell him, hey man, leave, leave your art school diploma at the door before you walk in here. Um, Scott's like one of the best guitar players I've ever known. And I'm very grateful to have played with him and to create with him. But he always thought that he was like the genius of the band. And without him, we would have been nothing. And he's probably right for that point in time. But... There, there comes a time where you have to realize that it's not just you, and I don't think he ever realized that, especially when I joined the band, because here I come in the band, and I, I never played bass before. I was playing, I played guitar, so it wasn't that big of a transition. I mean, a guitar has six strings, a bass has four. How hard could it be? So I joined the band, and of course, I already had like this image, and I was popular around town anyways, so I get in the band, and immediately I'm like, equal to Manson in the band, if not even greater as far as popularity goes. And I felt like he always resented that. And he thought he should have gotten more credit, you know, but he would have, but he always wanted to distan distance himself from the image of the band. You know, whether it was like not, not wearing makeup or not wearing the same clothes and not carrying a lunchbox. And he had a good image because he kind of like didn't fit in the band, but he did because he just looked so like like nerdy or whatever so he had like a good image but he wouldn't exploit his nerdiness or he wouldn't do anything to exploit his image you know he just would go against the grain and like we used to always carry lunch boxes that's something i brought to the band because i just collected them and i i needed stuff to carry my st something to carry my stuff in so i carried a lunch box and that's something the band picked up on and scott would refuse to carry a lunch box and i said well that's fine. Why don't you carry a paper bag, like a lunch bag? You know, David Berkowitz used to carry his gun in a paper bag, and it'd be kind of funny. You know, it'd be like an inside joke that we would only know. And he's, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's kind of like was his attitude in the band. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, if like on his tombstone, his epitaph would say, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the only musician in the band was Scott. The rest of us just played instruments. You know, like. I joined the band. I didn't know how to play bass. I, I learned how to play bass as I wrote the songs, basically. That's how I learned. And uh, Pogo, he didn't know how to play anything. He just was the only guy that had credit so he could get a sampler and a keyboard, and he was smart enough to run it. Uh, Manson, he never sung, did anything, never picked up an instrument. He didn't know what he was doing. So, yeah, technically, we sucked man but we could write music you know probably the reason we were good at writing songs is because all of our favorite bands wrote songs whether it was Kiss, um, David Bowie, um, the New York Dolls, the Sex Pistols <clears throat> um, you know a lot of those bands they didn't they weren't great technical musicians but you know what worked were the songs you know and in addition to that you know the stage show the image the promotions all that helped but Without the songs, you know, we wouldn't have been anything. So ultimately, that was the most important thing. But we placed uh, just as much or more emphasis on the image and everything else to, uh, to create something that we would like to see.
Uh, we we met John Tovar through the scene. He was him and uh, Frank Kalari were managing. I think it was Nuclear Valdez and the Mavericks. So he was. They were like the management. If we wanted big management locally, those were the guys to go with. So they came to see us play, and they wanted to manage us. And we signed a deal with them, which you know I never liked those two guys. I didn't really think that they, I mean, maybe I was naive, maybe I didn't pay too much attention, but it just seemed like they were kind of like muscle. They helped us get paid at gigs. You know, it didn't really, they certainly didn't get us a record deal. It was uh, Trent Reznor who got us the record deal, you know. So as far as locally, they were great, but after that, I don't really think they did too much. And, you know, it was like, they weren't the band's manager, they were Manson's manager. You know, it's like when, when stuff would happen with me, first thing is like kick them out of the band, get rid of them. You know, it's like they weren't looking out for my best interest and that's how I always felt towards them. It's like they're not managing the band, they're managing Manson and it was, it was, I felt like it was more than that. So that's really all I have to say about them. Cool. We started out with the drum machine and we used that for like a year or two and then I think it might have been Scott's decision to bring in the real drummer because he was friends with uh, with Freddie. So we figured we'd try it just to maybe give like more power to the music, to have live drums and to make it seem like a real band. So with the drum machine, it never really seemed like we were a band. It just seemed like we were just kind of like dancing monkeys in front of a machine. So we, we brought in Freddie and it was funny too, man, because he's like a cripple. He's got like a gimpy leg and he comes walking in like limping and his one leg is like a tenth of the size of his other leg. I'm thinking, how's this guy going to play like hit the bass drum, you know, and, and the hi-hat at the same time? But he was good, you know. He was good for a while. The only problem with him was like he had no stamina so he couldn't keep up like on tour or this and that, you know. He'd be good for one night and uh, his timing just was a little weird. But it was great with the with the new drummer brought you know some new blood to the band and uh, you know we exploited that when he came to the band you know went a date with the new drummer you know all that sort of stuff you know we'd release demos like maybe every six months you know as soon as we wrote some new songs we'd record them on the four track and then get them out to like local radio stations so they would play them and then we'd we'd sell them at the shows and pretty much just gave them out to people and just to create a buzz and just we were we were just so excited about the new songs we wanted everybody to hear them so immediately we'd record them and then we'd play them live for for a few months and then we re-record them so that's why there's like I mean like 10 different versions of every song I think the main reason we dropped the Spooky Kids was uh, the record label. They wanted to shorten the name down. And really, I, I didn't care, you know, but a lot of people in the band thought, oh, well, now it's Marilyn Manson. It's like just his thing. It's his solo thing and this and that. It was like an executive decision. And like, uh, I think it's easier to fit Marilyn Manson on a marquee than it is to fit Marilyn Manson in the Spooky Kids. So that, that, that's why they dropped the name. We pretty much became the biggest band like in Florida from like the first gig. You know, every show we had was packed and that's because of the promotions and, you know, us going out, hanging out at clubs, pe people seeing us, thinking like these guys are nuts. We tell them we have a band, you know, so they come, they bring their friends, they bring their girlfriends, you know, this and that. And then, then we started getting even a little bit bigger, you know, we'd get articles written about us, we'd be, we were winning awards, and every record label would come to see us, every record label would fly us to New, to New York to do showcases, and every label would turn us down, you know, we got turned down by everybody. Even when we got the record deal, we, we'd do the record, and we did it in Miami first, and for some reason, the record label didn't like it, like it. So we had to go to California to remix it 
while we're remixing it, we see that all the tracks are out of sync, so we had to like pretty much re-record the whole record. Then we have the record finished, artwork done. We give it to uh, Interscope, and they uh, they don't like it. They dropped us. So then Trent got his own label, and then he got us. He signed us to his record label. So we pretty much got dropped, uh, turned down, and dropped by like every every record label, you know. But uh, as let me go back as we're uh, getting bigger locally, you know, doing this and that, you know, I never thought that we'd be like a big band, you know. I just wanted, the goal I had was to be able to sp support ourselves, you know, through the music, you know, that was it. I just, I didn't want to work a nine to five job and if I could play music, you know, the first time I got paid, I was like, what's this for? You, I get paid for this? <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know, so... You know, the record labels, they were kind of grooming us to be like the next Jane's Addiction, you know, because Jane's Addiction was kind of like the biggest underground band at that time. So that's like what they could, the success they could compare it to, what they wanted. And we like surpassed that, you know. Like nowadays, like nobody even really knows Jane's Addiction, you know. You see like Dave Navarro, he's like Miss, Miss, Mr. Carmen Electra. I don't even think anybody knows he was in Jane's Addiction, which is like one of the most important bands ever. So that's like, uh, you know, we never thought it. I, I didn't think it'd be that big. I always wanted it to be that big, but I never realized it. You know, I don't think Manson did either. How could you think that it'd be that big and we'd cause that much of a ruckus? We uh, we uh, we did a record showcase in New York, and uh, for CMJ, and we played at the at the Limelight, which. Uh, at the Limelight, they used to have a thing there called Disco 2000, and it was run by Michael Alec, who was a club kid who wound up killing his friend who was a drug dealer, chopped him up, put him in a box, threw him in the river. So we get to the Limelight, and uh, we're hanging out, and we see all these like nutty people, like all the crazy makeup and carrying lunch boxes, and we're like, who, who are these people? We we're like pissed off, like what? <clears throat> they're stealing our like vibe, you know. It turns out they're like the club kids, and they had been doing this for like years, you know. So the night we played at the at the Limelight, it was uh, the same night as Disco Two Thousand, and we were booked to go on at twelve, but they moved us earlier. We played at like eight, and we were the record label. Everybody was going to come to see us at twelve, and this and that. So, but we go on stage, and we see all these like transvestites, she males, club kids, and we're playing in front of all these people. And we just didn't know what the hell was going on. It was it was great, but uh, later we were hanging out with uh, all the club kids and, and Michael Alec, and this was pretty pretty much right around the time where all that stuff went down. I think where he we where he killed those guys, and uh, so later on, you know, just like a year ago, I find out that we we hung out with the, those people, and uh, but like we took from the club kids when we saw that we like took that influence and like exploited that and we. we took more of that element because we were we were already club kids we just didn't know it you know we were just had a band Manson met Trent I think he met him even before we they had the band cuz um, Manson was writing for a local magazine and he did an interview with Trent and they were both, I don't know if they were both from the same town, but they were both from Ohio, so they had that like kind of thing going on. So when Manson made the first demo tape, he gave Trent a copy when they, when they played, when Nine Inch Nails played down here. And uh, Trent liked it. But Manson and him kept in contact with each other, and then we opened up for, for Nine Inch Nails. Like, that was my first gig with them. So we just kept some, sending him demos, and he like, you know, dug it and would hook us up with uh, different record labels if he could, and this and that. And so, you know, we were, we were doing showcases for pretty much every record label that, that ever was, but nobody wanted us. They all turned us down. And then finally, uh, I think Trent was on Interscope at that time, so we got the hookup to Interscope through Trent. And they came to see us a few times, you know, put us in the studio to do, like, more professional demos. And so we got signed to Interscope. 
and then uh, we got like uh, an advance. You know, they gave us a certain amount of money to do the record. They gave us um, a certain amount of money for equipment. It was like nothing, man. It was like it's kind of like embarrassing to tell you how much money we got, but uh, we got like a publishing advance, so we all got like half of the money up front, and you know. We each got like a few thousand dollars and we're like in heaven. It's like, this is great. You know, they're giving us this money. It's nuts. So they put us in the studio. We go to Miami, I guess, to cut down on costs from flying us somewhere and putting us up in, in hotels and that. And we do the record with uh, Rolly Mossaman produced it, who used to be in the Swans. And we thought that was really cool because the Swans were like one of the pioneers of like the industrial movement. So we thought it'd be like good to have him do us. So we did. We were in the studio in uh, in Miami, and it was uh, Criteria, who I think I know the Bee Gees record there. They either own it or Julio Iglesias owns the studio. And the Dead Boys recorded there, so I was like excited about that. And a bunch of people recorded there. We were there for about a month, and you know, pretty pretty standard recording. You know, just go in, do your tracks, and and split or whatever. And uh, and then they set us in a, up in a hotel, and me and Manson like shared a room. So like as soon as we got out of the studio, we'd go back to the hotel room, and you know there'd be chicks coming and going. It was typical. You know we thought we were rock stars at that moment, so we were like living it. You know, and I, I was like I wasn't on drugs then. I was trying to like be clean, and Manson didn't do any drugs, so it was like we pretty much had like sex addictions, and that was like what we were, you know, what we were doing. So we, we finished the record, and then uh, Manson flew out to L.A. to mix it with Trent. And then I went there like a week later to hang out. And as we're there, we realized all the tracks are like out of sync. It's like the whole record is like messed up. So we had to pretty much re-record everything. And then uh, we did... Uh, the drums were like screwy. The bass was out, so I had to redo all my bass lines. And then... Uh, and the drums were like so messed up. We I think we wound up using like a drum machine for the whole record. It's like a lot of people don't know that it's not live live drums. It's computers. And then when I got out to L.A., I started getting like messed up with like drugs again. So the whole like record was like recorded like on on heroin. And I had like these nutty like trashy like girls coming and going like she males you know and i'd leave with these people like all the time and come back but I, I did the record great you know i didn't mess anything up so we finished the record and uh you know we did it gave it to the gave the art did the artwork for it, took the pictures gave it to the record label and they hated it you know they're like well you're gonna have to change this and that so we changed a few things they still hated it they dropped us so we have no record Deal. But at the same time, they had given Trent um, his own record label, which he called Nothing Records. So we tried to get another deal through some other people, but it never worked. So Trent's just like, I'm going to put the record out myself. And if it wasn't for Trent Reznor, I mean, there'd probably be no Marilyn Manson today. You know, whether it was his connections to get us, you know, the record deal in the first place to picking us up once we got dropped. You know, so he's like, it was a big big reason for Manson, whether it was the influence or the business end. Yeah, well, Manson did the vocals at the Tate House, you know, where the Manson murders took place, and... I'm not sure if they mixed it there. I think we mixed it all at a... Oh, this is good. We mixed it at the the record plant, I think it was called, or the power station, something like that. <clears throat> but when we, when we were there, Prince was in the next room, the next studio next to us, and he was recording Carmen Electra before she was known. She was doing a record, and he was recording it. And before we get there, they tell us, don't talk to Prince. Don't even look him in the eyes. You know, if you do, you'll be kicked out, you know? So we get there, and as soon as we see him, hey, hey, what's up, Prince? And he was like the artist formerly known as. He had the symbol that was his name. So we're like, Prince, Prince. And, you know, he was just like, he got so pissed off at us. And we're bringing in uh, uh, prostitutes and shemale prostitutes off of Santa Monica Boulevard, and they're all jumping into the hot tub. And, 
and we weren't doing it to be like shocking. We're more we're doing it to just kind of like annoy them, and we we're just like kids in a candy store and just like taking every vice we had and throwing it in people's faces and just you know trying to be rock stars. A lot of the lyrics from the first record, from Portrait, I think are very tongue in cheek, and there's like a lot of meaning going on in there. I don't think one song has really one meaning. Maybe like Get Your Gun might, because it's about like abortion and all that, but that's more of like a reaction to talk shows. And like, we weren't like real strong against abortion or anti-abortion or this and that. It was just kind of like, we were reflecting the media and the the crazy abortion people went and shot that doctor, Dr. Gun. So like Manson wrote a song about it. Um, cake and sodomy, you know, white trash gets out on your knees. We were really into like trash culture and white trash. So that's that song I think was a reaction to that. Um, My Monkey was like took lyrics from a Charles Manson song and then added some stuff to it. It's like I don't really think a lot of the songs in the early days were really trying to make a statement other than he was trying to reflect just what we were watching on TV that week, you know? When the record was finished and I heard it, I, I didn't really like it, but I didn't really like the music too much when I was in the band. It, I thought like, would I buy this record? Would I listen to this music? No, because it was a little bit too techno, like with the keyboards and the, the dance beats. You know, I didn't really dig it that much. But now when I listen to it, it's, it's great. You know, like the first record, I think it's Manson's best record creatively, lyrically, you know, it, it's, like now his choruses are like very, you know, like now that now his lyrics are very straightforward and it's like very repetitive. It's it's pop music. Whereas like in the beginning How bad is this? Yeah, again it's that what? Really? Yeah. Okay, well let's try again. Let's hope that shut up. Let's start from the beginning no, if I like that. Where you like his lyrics. His lyrics. Um now lately, like since uh Man, pr probably since Antichrist on, his lyrics have become like very repetitive, chorus oriented, very pop, you know. Whereas uh, Portrait was very, very arty, very you know creative, you know, with all the the samples and and changes and and stuff. And the lyrics were were brilliant, you know, very, uh, <clears throat> and very very creative if if you re read them. But uh. So I didn't really, well, when the record first came out, I, I didn't like it because I was into, uh, you know, more raw music, punk rock, you know, um, whatever. But uh, the Portrait album had a very heavy industrial, like almost Nine Inch, Nine Inch Nails influence, who I never liked. So that's why I didn't really like the record. But <clears throat> when I listen to it now, it's great. It's brilliant. I love it. I li will listen to it occasionally, you know, but I, I didn't like it when it first came out. I left the band, I guess it was 93, Christmas of 93, and I, uh, after a series of heroin overdoses, run-ins with the law, uh, warnings from the band, the management, the record labels, um, everything pro pretty much broke down at that point where I, I was forced into, a, into rehab. So I went in there, it was a Christmas, a few days before Christmas, and Manson came to visit me crying, oh, just get better, you know, you're doing the right thing, we're going on tour in six months, you get it together, you know, everything will be cool. So I thought, okay, good, you know, I'll stay in this rehab for a month or whatever, do what I got to do. And then uh, I get a letter, like Christmas Eve, like FedEx, thinking it's like a Christmas card or something, and no, it was like a form letter from the management your services are no longer needed, you know, this and that. So I got fired like on Christmas Eve in rehab. And uh, so that was that. So I'm in rehab and I'm 
thinking like they have a show on New Year's Eve and I'm going to be in rehab on New Year's Eve and I'm thinking like well what's going on and uh, so they got that that uh, Twiggy guy in the band and uh, I'm like well man he better not be using my equipment and all this so I'm in rehab calling managers screaming and then I'm, I'm in rehab with all these criminals you know drug addicts that are nuts and I'm telling them what happened and I got these big like black dudes asking me where Manson lives and I'm like right down the street from his house the the rehab was in the same neighborhood and they're like oh tell me uh, you know I got an alibi I'm in rehab I'll go over there and I'll make it look like an accident I'll do this and that and it was like almost gonna happen it was like a serious thing that like damage was gonna be done to like him and his family because I was in that frame of mind and I didn't uh you know I felt felt, felt like I was wronged you know because he tells me I'm still in the band, you know, and this and that. And uh, two days later, I get this letter, you know, you're fired. So I was, you know, needless to say, I was in a bad mood for years after that, you know, especially when the record came out and he's on the cover of every magazine and I have no money, I'm strung out, you know. Um, when I got out of rehab, I was... I, the way I was thinking was I was going to have like a meeting with everybody and try to tell them like, okay, I understand, you know, what happened. I'm sorry. Could I just like talk to you all with the managers there, of course. And uh, I wanted to have it like at our warehouse and I was going to like get them all into the warehouse and close the door and pour gasoline everywhere and set everybody on fire. So I had all these crazy like revenge fantasies and it took me years to get over it until I realized that it, it wasn't their fault. It was my fault. You know, it was like if I was in their position, I would have done the same thing. So, you know, it all worked out, you know. The music has changed a lot through the years because the members have always changed. You know, it's always going to be a Manson record because it's Manson. You know, but like with Mechanical Animals, it's a different guitar player, you know. And with Antichrist, it was different members. And even the recent records, it's all different members. So the music has always like changed a little bit. And as far as like uh, the attitude and the image, it's pretty much stayed the same. I mean, yeah, it's changed, this and that. It might have like a Nazi reference or a glam reference, but it's still Marilyn Manson. It's not, his image has never like made any really big departure. Manson is the po most popular band that's uh, controversial. There's way more people that have been more controversial than Manson, whether it was Gigi Allen, or even you could go as far back as the, the 20s and 30s with Dada art. They were doing stuff that was considered more offensive than what Manson's doing. But Manson has become the poster boy for, you know, Christian disdain or, or whatever it is. It's just like everybody needs a figurehead. Everybody needs a scapegoat. Manson was at the right place at the right time. And that's why he's so popular. You know, if they just left him alone, his fame wouldn't be what it was. And like with Columbine, I, I don't even think those guys even listen to Manson. It's just they're, Manson's like the most popular band doing crazy stuff and like deals with certain subjects. So it must have been the, the, the heavy metal. It must have been the Manson. It must have been the TV that did this. You know, nobody takes responsibility for, for their actions, whatever it is, whether it's uh, for their children, for their own relationships, for their drug problems. You know, that's the problem with uh, that I see a lot today in America. It's nobody, everybody wants to blame some, somebody or somebody wants to buy something that's going to fix it or they want to take a pill. And like, you know, I guess Manson is that pill that it's hard to swallow, you know, and that it's just they had the hit, you know, they did a cover of Sweet, Sweet Dreams, gave them a little success, you know, it was a stepping stone to Antichrist Superstar. Um, Beautiful People was a catchy song, was at the right place at the right time, had a crazy video. So they're famous. They talk about the devil. The Christian church goes crazy, you know. There's so many other crazier bands that are doing stuff way worse than that. There's Deicide, Morbid Angel, Slayer, you know, that could easily have been blamed for all of that and more, you know.
but it's you know it's sexy to blame Manson for that stuff. Now it's kind of like a cartoon now. I probably won't get blamed too much anymore. Well, I had a band like after I left Manson called the Dolly Gaggers, which was kind of like a like an arty hardcore band. Um, and that, that was going great, but you know, when you're in a band, you have other people you're dealing with, other personalities, you know, somebody gets pissed off, somebody leaves. So ultimately the, the band like had broken up and I was trying to still do that when I was trying to teach myself how to do screen prints. Cause again, the, the Warhol influence. So I, I taught myself how to do screen prints and then uh, I started dabbling with painting and then somebody offered me an art show. And I only had like maybe two paintings. And they're like, well, I don't have anything. They're like, oh, no, you can make a bunch of paintings. So I was kind of forced to paint. And it came out good and it had a good response and people like it, liked it. I sold some stuff. So I figured, well, let me keep doing this. And then I realized, well, man, I can do art by myself. I don't have to be in a band and deal with other personalities. And art is great, man. You just do the painting, and there it is. You don't have to deal with the producer in the recording studio. You don't have to deal with the record label. You don't have to deal with other band members. You just have to deal with the person that owns the gallery, you know? And a lot of the stuff I sell on my own, like on my website, so I don't have to deal with anybody. And I get all the money. You don't have to deal with personalities. It's the best, man. I should have been doing this all along. It's like the ideal art form is painting and sculpture and whatnot. The solitary artist is the ideal life. I've been getting lots of shows. Just did one with uh, Clive Barker. I got my first solo show in a month and just been selling lots of paintings. Been going pretty good for the past two years. And I'm affiliated with a group called Unpop Art. And we're kind of like the antithesis of pop art where we, we do a lot of paintings dealing with unpopular images, certain things that wouldn't be considered art. You know, some of the stuff could be misconstrued as sexist or, or racist, but that's not, that's not it. We just take unpopular Im images and turn it into art, and it's kind of like a juxtapose of different viewpoints and, and stuff. It's pretty exciting to be associated with that because it's like, it's a real movement, and there really hasn't been a real global art movement since pop art, and it's very exciting. And all the artists have personality, you know, everybody's like a character, whether it's like Boyd Rice or Jim Goad or Sean Partridge, they're all, in, all incredible artists. And we have, you know, filmmakers like Larry Wessel, writers, Adam Parfrey. So it's exciting to be, be, be a part of that because I was very influenced by pop art and I haven't seen anything like pop art since then, which was like the 60s and 70s, and there really ha hasn't been an art movement and there hasn't been any superstar artists since Warhol. Even since then, there was only like a handful, like Salvador Dali, uh, Jackson Pollock, Picasso. All the other like famous artists got famous after they were dead. You know, so why shouldn't you be famous while you're doing what you do? Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. I know Manson was reading the Satanic Bible when I knew him, but I thought it was silly. I was like, what is this? you got to be kidding me. Come on. So I didn't want to have nothing to do with it. And he used to try to get me to read it. And, you know, after I left the band, he was still into it. And I heard he was going to, like, the met Anton and was into the church. And I still thought it was completely ridiculous. But then I read it. I actually sat down and I figured, well, I want to know what he's thinking. You know, I just want to kind of know like why he reads this. So I figure you really can't judge anybody until you've like walked in their shoes. So I picked it up and I read it. It was cool. It's not even like a Bible. It's just kind of like a philosophy. It's almost like rehashed like Nietzsche, Darwinism, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, give love to people who deserve it. And I think that's what attracted him to it. And I had already been thinking that way anyways. So it's like I had like, as far as the Church of Satan goes, the Anton LaVey philosophy, I had already been living like that for years. And I guess that's why Manson wanted to turn me on to it. Because he's like, you're like a Satanist anyways. Like, why don't you? It has nothing to do with uh, 
killing babies and, and drinking their blood and this and that. But some of the rituals they do, I think, are kind of silly. But the whole philosophy around it is, I guess, what attracted him, what attracted Manson to it because it was like, it was shocking, but it had some sort of real philosophy where it was like strong and it, it made sense where as like uh, praying to somebody some fairy tale you know or like you know going to church and saying a bunch of Hail Marys and you're forgiven it, it doesn't didn't make sense so I guess that's why he was attracted to uh, to that you know something to latch on to something not necessarily belong to but it was just you know Made sense. And then also you say you're a Satanist and people are like, oh my God, you're like, you're crazy. What are you thinking? So that was very attractive, I guess. Um, I don't know. I guess he can keep making, I guess Manson can keep making records, you know, because each record is sort of successful. But I, I think it's definitely gone downhill. I would like to see him do something completely different, like like an acoustic record even, or something like really arty, where he like goes back to the portrait days where it is more creative and it's not so much like a pop song. You know, I'd like to see that. But I, I, I don't know. He's definitely made his mark and he really doesn't even need to do anything in the future. This day and age, like the attention span with people, it's amazing that it's lasted this long, you know. I, I don't know. I'd like to see him do something different. Uh, I think one of the secrets to our success was, was first we had catchy songs, you know, you could sing along to them. You know, we all looked, we were entertaining to look at, you know, aesthetically, you know, as, as uh, performers, um, stage show. Um, you know, we were just different. We were at the right place at the, at the right time, you know, like... Uh, the most popular music that at that time was was grunge and there was no stage show whatsoever and I used to think you know when I go to a show I want to see a show I don't want to see some guy that just pumped my gas you know so that's kind of like we just emulated our influences and I think that's why we became so popular we were different and I mean we just knew it you know we had the attitude like we're rock stars we weren't but we were, you know, in our heads, and people could feel that. They could feel the excitement. Not necessarily they could feel that we were going to be huge someday or this and that, but it was just snowball effect. You know, the, the publicity, the propaganda we spread was a big part of it. Without that, it w might not have happened. So you can't really put your finger on why. You know, who knows why anything happens, you know? In the early days, we worked at a, a record store together, and he was like a clerk, you know, selling records and this and that. And I worked in the back doing shipping and receiving, which gave me plenty of opportunity to put stuff down my pants and walk out with, so that was a good job for me. But one day I came to the, to the store, and he wasn't there. And I asked the, the, the boss, I'm like, hey, where is he? What happened? <laughs> I'm like, oh, he, Brian's mom called and said he quits, he can't work here anymore because the incense bothers his nose. And this was a record store where we sold incense, you know, like patchouli, vanilla incense. And uh, so his mom called and fired his job for him, like he couldn't do it himself. And I, I thought that, always thought that was funny because it, we didn't even burn the incense, we just sold him in there. But, you know, he's like the spooky Satan guy and the incense bothers his nose. Uh, another story... We, uh, we were at some club in Miami, and it was late. Afterwards, we went to go eat at a restaurant. And the place was packed, and we're sitting down in there with a friend of ours. And the waitresses keep walking back and forth. They won't wait on us. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I jump up on the table and start screaming, like, I'm Jesus Christ. Go fuck yourself. Help us. So they throw us out of the place. And I, I picked up a salt shaker off of the table for whatever reason, I don't know. I guess I felt like they owed it to me because they didn't serve us. 
So and I'm trashed. I'm really, really drunk. And we walk out of the place, and these uh, these Latin guys drive by and screaming at us, you know, Americon, you know, fuck you, faggot. So I, I take the salt shaker and I throw it at their car and smash their windshield and I'm like, oh man. So we get in the car and we drive away. We're driving, my friend's driving and uh, I'm in the front and uh, Manson's in the back. And my friend pulls into this police station thinking that they won't stop in there. So we get out of the car and those, the, the guys, they get out of the car too. And they come up to me and just like smack me one right in the face and, and I my mouth is bleeding so I like spit blood like all in the guy's face and then this other guy hits me and I'm down on the ground and I fall on the ground I start laughing and freaking out and they're like what's going on and I'm looking around like where's Manson and he's like in the back seat of the car like hiding I'm like man what the hell and so you know everybody that thinks he's so spooky he's not that spooky